All right, thanks Dan for the good introduction. And I'm gonna talk about, so whereas Dan's slide kind of focused on the whole coastline, we're gonna focus in on one specific area in the North Coast region. Um, and before I start, I just wanna step back and say that the ocean is vast. It covers the majority of the planet. And as humans, not adapted for life at sea, it's really hard for us to study. So uh, recognizing the impossibility of monitoring everything in the marine environment, many scientists and managers have tried to identify species similar to canaries in a coal mine that can indicate things that we're interested in, including characterizing marine systems and detecting changes that are happening, and then ideally being able to identify uh, causes of change. So including El Nino events or human actions and which, which would be the establishment of marine protected areas. So just to point out, seabirds are very unique members of the marine community. When you look out at the ocean, a lot of things are under the water and seabirds are at the land or at the air-sea interface. They, they have to breathe air most of the time so they're always gonna be visible. Um, and by definition, they rely on the marine environment to survive and reproduce, so they feed at the top of the food chain, many of them, and they, their persistence in the environment requires a fully functional food web. During the non-breeding season, they're dispersed in the environment, uh, but they're still gonna be at the surface, so even on boat surface, you can find them pretty easily. And then during the nesting season, they will congregate at offshore islands at huge numbers, so large segments of the population will be able to be studied. And they're really visible, and this helps us to make a number of different monitoring metrics. So they're visible from space, basically. On Google, you can see MERS at Castle Rock. But once you're on the colony, they're super dense, and you can get a lot of observations of a lot of different individuals. One other thing that makes seabirds unique, these are not seabirds that nest in the North Coast region, but this picture shows that you know they cannot fly too far from their colony before they have to return to incubate and feed chicks. So their productivity, their ability to reproduce, really depends on the waters that are surrounding the colony um, and how hard they have to work to find fish and the fish they can feed to their young is dependent on this water surrounding breeding colonies. So we can learn a lot about <coughs> regional marine conditions by looking at what seabirds are doing at their colonies. Along the North Coast, seabirds, there's a limited handful of colonies that exist, and as Dan was mentioning, most of the seabirds are at Castle Rock, and this is especially true for common MERS. Um, so if you look at the context of the marine protected areas in the North Coast region, Castle Rock is up in Northern California, well, almost in Oregon, and if you look at kind of the maximum distance that seabirds can forage from the colony, which is about 100 kilometers, it does include a number of state marine conservation areas and other marine protected areas, with Castle Rock itself being a special closure. Um, so we think that marine protected areas will impact seabirds directly by protecting nesting habitats, but also indirectly by enhancing prey communities across the region. Um, so in terms of the seabirds that are nesting at Castle Rock, there's <coughs> A diversity of them, but we focused in on common MERS just because we're trying to characterize baseline conditions and we can really learn a lot from MERS as opposed to like nocturnal burrow nesting seabirds, which we can't really see at all. Another good thing about MERS is they're well studied, so uh, we can make conclusions about marine conditions based on what we see them eating. As you can see, here's four different images of MERS with four different prey types. So you get a good idea of what's happening around the environment. Um, their abundance, reproduction, foraging effort, and diet reflect marine conditions. And another nice thing is they're circumpolar. So in the northern hemisphere, we can make comparisons within the California current, Alaska, the Atlantic Ocean, and you, they're all the same species, so we can understand how things are varying at a bunch of different scales. So this is Castle Rock from shore, and it's kind of too far to study with spotting scopes, so we put uh, robotic cameras out that look like this. I can control them from any computer, pretty much. <coughs> and they can zoom and tilt, and we get a lot of cool video footage. Um, so basically, this has been a long-term study. It started in 2007 with the Ocean Science 
Trust and Sea Grant funding 2014. I try to include as much data as I have ready. So, um, but in terms of reproductive success, we followed 872 nests over this period. Uh, foraging effort, 103 chick rearing pairs and chick diet. 3,855 prey were identified by me. So, um, so basically, just nest surveys. How that goes briefly is. We number individuals before they lay an egg and we basically look at what's happening to that nest site every other day for the duration. So we just look and say, does it have an egg, does it have a chick? And at some point you can tell how well individuals have reproduced if you do that for the whole breeding season. So to get into some of the data, nest initiation. Um, you can see seabirds don't just say it's like April 29th, I'm gonna start nesting. Uh, some of the earlier nesting will start around 19th of April in terms of our study period and then later uh, all the way to the 19th of May. So that's like a month of variability. And um, one thing that's driving that, so if I put overlay on this, the timing of spring transition, which is the onset of upwelling <coughs> favorable conditions, uh, nest initiation really is tracking when spring trans transition happens. And that's just because, you know, nutrient-rich water becomes available to these birds and they need a little bit of time before females are ready to produce eggs. Um, we can tell something about the marine environment just by seeing when they initiate nesting. And then in terms of reproductive success, so we have years on the x-axis and percent of successful nesting on Y, and you can see it, it kind of ranges from 53% at the low point to 90% at the high, averaging 74%. Um, and then in 2016, we had a pretty poor year where most chicks were starving, so it's 21%. But you can see it's pretty stable across the whole study period. Um, only in really aberrant conditions will it go down. So in general, we get lots of chicks. Um, so I want to talk briefly for foraging effort, how we, we infer this by how MERS spend their time at the colony. So for some birds, food availability really impacts fledging success, but MERS have flexible time allocation. So when food's really good, individuals will spend like up to 40% of their day together with their chick at the rock. But as food becomes harder and harder to find, one individual of a breeding pair will spend more time at sea and then if it gets really hard to come by fish, they'll actually leave their chicks alone at the rock to get enough food. Um, so time allocation surveys are kind of similar. We take the birds that we study in nest surveys, but we record them for full days, once a week for the chickering period. And we can get the amount of time that both adults are spending at the nest. So like I was saying, at colonies where food's really easy to come by, this number would be more like 40%, but at Castle Rock, we never see it go above 5%, and sometimes it's virtually 0%. So this is very limited in indicating uh, that food is hard for these mirrors to come by, but obviously they're getting enough for, to reproduce in most years. Um, and also you can see it's very rare that mirrors will leave their chicks alone at the nest because the chance of getting eaten by a gull is really high at that point. So in 2007, up to a, on average, 20% of the day, chicks would be alone at their nest site. So that's really frequent, and also showing that MERS are working hard at this colony to feed their chicks. So what we saw for diet, um, I have a video. I'm not sure if I can, yeah, play it. Kind of want to show you the quality of the video. So we, for diet surveys, we'll scan for individuals holding fish, and we'll zoom in. We could zoom in much further than this, it's just this particular video we didn't, but um, it gives you a good idea of the quality. We can see many views of different prey, and it's nice, we've seen Tim Mulligan actually help me. I thought it was a cuscule, at first we thought it was gunnel, gunnel, but then we saw a prey that was, I could see modified pectoral fins, and we were in his office, being like, oh my god, it's a cuscule, but the fact that we can even see that is not possible the way that seabirds are traditionally studied with spotting scopes. So at Castle Rock, the three most common prey type are smelt, rockfish, and salmon. And that's true like pretty much across the entire study period. So the yellow, blue, and pink, that's smelt, rockfish, salmon, respectively. And then this little bars, <coughs> the remaining is all the other species. Um, 
So in 2016, we haven't gone through the diet yet, but I can tell you from doing the surveys and watching the video, we're going to have a lot more anchovy than we've ever seen, which is interesting. And if anyone has any ideas, I'm not sure why. But we do see a diversity of other prey types. There's been 21 different taxa identified. And uh, it's very different from what they see at the Farallons. So at the Farallons, things like herring and anchovy and hake and cod and flatfish are really dominating, and we don't see that up here. So just to briefly link these things, seabird observations to marine conditions is kind of like, uh, there's different pieces that provide <coughs> images of different parts of the puzzle. So abundance is one part. And the pros of abundance is that it gives you broad scale variation in seabird populations, and you can measure it like all at all the colonies, all at once. You can fly and take photos. What's bad about it is that there's, seabirds are long lived, so changes in population lag between changes in the marine system. So, like, really quickly, I just wanted to show you. Let's say you have 600,000 seabirds in year one, and they don't breed at all and then the next year they don't breed at all. It still looks like you have 600,000 seabirds because none of them are dying, but they're not breeding. And then that happens again, let's say it continues to happen. Then in a, you know, year 20, then the population will crash. So there's a lot, there can be a long lag between when things are changing and when you actually see it in terms of abundance. But abundance does indicate long-term region-wide change in marine productivity. So another piece is reproduction. So right away, you know if seabirds are having difficulty. You don't have to wait multiple years to, to know that there, there's going to be a population decline. And it, it, so it informs why seabird populations change. The one bad part is it's difficult to measure at all the locations. It's really labor intensive. And uh, so you can really only focus in on certain areas. And there's no within your sensitivity. So like. We can only tell if years are good and bad. Um, there's no idea about anything finer than that. Um, so the third thing is foraging effort, which the pros are that it rapidly reflects marine condition. If these are three breeding birds and each fish represents what they need to get through the season, like this is going to be really easy for them, and their behaviors are going to reflect that. And if there's only a few fish, you know, they're going to be working hard the minute fish become hard to come by. So their behaviors rapidly reflect, reflect marine conditions. The negatives are that it's difficult to measure this at many colonies, and so you also have to kind of figure out which colony you want to understand and have it be representative. And then basically it indicates changes in the availability of prey at daily, weekly, annual scales. Um, and then the fourth aspect is diet, which the pros of this is uh, for many seabirds, they can't dive that long. They get underwater and they're going to grab what they can get. So they're a natural sample of the marine environment. The cons is that it's difficult to get this without the cameras. Like if you saw, if you were doing a live survey and you saw something you never saw before, you're going to be like, I don't know what it is. At least with video, you can say, Hey, people who knew fish. So, like on that that corner, that's actually a Pacific salary. We saw like ten of them in 2010, and never again, never before. So we were able to take that and be like, "What is this?" Um, and I showed you annual changes, but you can track changes in prey from week to week or day to day by the way we collect the data. So, uh, for example, in red is smelt, and you can see it starts high, goes low, and then comes back. And then rockfish, it's kind of trading off with rockfish. I don't know why that pattern is, but we can track these changes in real time as they happen with, with the diet. So um, all these things together give us a better picture of what's happening in the marine system and allow us to create a baseline and characterization of what's happening, at least from the perspective of a seabird. But that's OK if it's consistent over time. So. Basically, what we'd recommend is this multi-scale approach. Uh, just studying abundance may not get you <coughs> the, the resolution you need to link seabirds to changes in the marine environment. But if you can add in a couple complementary metrics, you can get a really good idea of what's going on. And then the benefit of video is this, we can be in the colony without disturbing it. We can, it's permanent. It's archived, so we can go back to old video in the future. And then also, we stream this online. so. Uh, Basically, with that, I'd like to thank everybody that's involved 
it's been a huge amount of effort over the years to keep this project going. And uh, with that, I can take questions, or if you want to watch the live video, the link is available. <laughs> Actually, we only got us. Usually, we'll see a couple thousand fish in a given year. And uh, in 2016, basically everything died so fast due to starvation that I only even have 200 fish videos from that year. 